Hey everyone, it's Mr. C again, and I'm going to try to give a little help here on reading comprehension. So I'm going to give an example here of why reading is so important, because even though we have videos like this one, it takes so much longer to listen to a book or watch a video than it does to read. So I'm going to give an example of that right here. Right? I'm going to do something that where I'm going to have to do reading comprehension. So I just typed in uh, reading practice and test. I picked this um, article. Could have picked a different one. Um, but uh, th this, is, this is literacy in French. Right? So you're reading in English. I'm going to be reading in French. La celebration de Pâques. Pâques est en fête catholique célèbre le 21 avril. Elle commémore la résurrection de Jésus mais fait aussi le printemps. Tandis que les gens qui fleurissent les parents de ce monde de chocolat dans le jardin en fin de célébrer Pâques. Now, that's just reading and pronouncing. So if I can say that I do that, I'm really not even literate in French. In other words, being able to read a word doesn't mean I understand what that means. So. Reading comprehension means that I, that I see the word and I understand what it's talking about. So I'll, I'll guide you through that here very briefly. Pâques is the French word for Easter. Easter is a fête, that's where we get the word festival, is a festival Catholic, a, festival, a Catholic festival celebrated the 21st of April. It remembers, or commemorates the resurrection of Jesus, but fête aussi, it's a, a festival also of spring, printemps. Tandis, I think, is while the, and I think Jean Kiel is lilies, but I don't remember that word. Bloom, fleurice, parents share or distribute, or maybe it's hide, I'm not sure, I don't remember that word, so I'm, I'd have to look that up, just like you would have to look up a word that you don't know. The chocolate in the garden, according to celebrating Easter. Petit comme grand peuvent ainsi partir à la chasse à l'œuf. Young or small and big, petit and grand, but young and old can alike partake in the egg chase. So reading comprehension is helpful, but it's particularly helpful because it's way faster to be able to read and understand than to watch a video or to have to listen to an audio. So let's give an example of that from the homework for this week. Okay, so here's the questions and then here's the reading, right? Let, let's do just reading and I'm going to start, I'm just going to sight read, I'm going to start with envisioned and then I'm going to hit my timer. I haven't started reading yet so I'm going to look at my timer. Here's my timer on my clock and I'm going to hit stopwatch and start and now I'm going to envision. I'm going to silently read. Okay, stop. That's 27 seconds. Okay. Now I'm going to read at audio pace, like if you were listening to somebody reading for you. I'm going to read at audio pace now. 27 seconds for sight reading. Let's do audio pace. I'm going to reset the clock and start. Envisioned a new campaign designed to bring relief to Virginia, draw new recruits to his army, and score a victory decisive enough to bring European recognition to the Confederacy. To accomplish all this, Lee wanted to take the war north. A Confederate victory on Union soil would also embolden opposition to President Abraham Lincoln's party in the upcoming November congressional elections. Knowing his army was undersupplied, Lee told Confederate President Jefferson Davis, we cannot afford to be idle. So, on September 4th, Lee and his nearly 70,000 strong army of Northern Virginia crossed the Potomac River unopposed and entered Maryland for the first time in the war. 
Little went right for Lee after that. Okay, stop. That is a minute and six seconds. So that's over twice as long. So let's go back and look at these questions that we've got to ask. I've got five questions. Try to have five points for each day because I know there's a lot of things we've got to get done. There's five things we're looking for on this, okay? Read the following paragraphs and answer the guided questions. What three things was Lee new, Lee's new campaign in 86 story designed to do? Number two, analyze how did the geography, that's the terrain and the soil of the region that Lee occupied, affect the fact that few new recru recruits flocked to the rebels? Uh, again, as we've said in previous videos, the South is a country called the Confederate States of America, the Confederacy. They're also known as the rebels. South, rebels, Confederacy. The North is the Union and the Yankees. So North, South, Union, Confederacy, Rebels, Yankees. Well, I should say Yankees, Rebels. What bad luck for the Confederates gave Union Commander McClellan a huge advantage and the reason to brag to President Lincoln that he, quote, had the Rebels? Number four, who won the battle? Explain. Number five, when we say a battle is bloody, we're talking about numbers killed and wounded. How bloody was the Battle of Antietam compared to battles in wars like World War II, for example, D-Day, or Vietnam, example, the Yadrang Valley, that's what the movie We Were Soldiers is based on, or Iraq, that's more recently, for example, the Battle of Fallujah. Okay, let's start reading. In the spring of 1862, General Robert E. Lee defeated Major General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac on the Virginia Peninsula in the Seven Days Campaign. Those victories relieved Richmond and shifted the focus of the war into Northern Virginia. There, at the end of August, Lee defeated Major General John Pope's Army of Virginia at Second Manassas. With no organized Union forces to bar his way, Lee envisioned a new campaign designed to bring relief to Virginia, draw new recruits to his army, and score a victory decisive enough to bring European recognition to the Confederacy. To accomplish all this, Lee wanted to take the war north. Now, accomplish all what? Maybe first question, what was that first question? Three things Lee's new campaign in 1862 was designed to do. Hmm. Three things to accomplish. Hmm. A Confederate victory on Union soil would also embolden opposition to President Abraham Lincoln's party in the upcoming November congressional elections. Knowing his army was undersupplied, Lee told Confederate President Jefferson Davis, we cannot afford to be idle. So on September 4th, Lee and his nearly 70,000 strong Army of Northern Virginia crossed the Potomac River unopposed and entered Maryland for the first time in the war. Little went right for Lee after that. Panic gripped the national capital, that would be Washington, D.C., as Lee moved north, and Lincoln was once again forced to find an Army commander, reluctantly. He ordered McClellan, who had been defeated by Lee in the Seven Days Campaign. So he already had lost to that team, to that coach. Ordered McClellan to take command of the federal forces, defeated at Second Manassas. Second Manassas, because the first land battle of the war that we've talked about and you answered questions about, was First Manassas. And those from the Army of the Potomac defeated on the peninsula. Although vain and egotistical, McClellan was an expert in organizing an army, which was just what was needed to meet the crisis. Within a week, McClellan had reinvigorated the demoralized elements of both armies and prepared to confront Lee's new threat with 80,000 men. McClellan's force included thousands of raw recruits, enlistees who had responded 
to Lincoln's call for 300,000 volunteers earlier in the year. Perhaps one quarter, one fourth of the new Union Army, that's 80,000 men, one fourth of that would be 20,000, had not yet fired their muskets at the enemy. Beginning September 4th, McClellan's Sixth Corps of Infantry moved out of the defenses of Washington to intercept Lee. Lee and his men crossed the Potomac using the river fords near Leesburg, just 40 miles upriver from Washington, D.C. He had anticipated that the federal garrisons at Harper's Ferry and Martinsburg, some 20 and 40 miles, Harper's Ferry is 20 miles, Martinsburg is 40 miles, further northwest in Virginia, would be called back to join McClellan's army or be sent to defend Washington. Gathering his army around Frederick, Maryland on September 7th, Lee was disheartened to learn that the Union troops south of the Potomac had not moved and were now located in the rear of his invading force. Undaunted, Lee sought to capitalize on his presence in Maryland, hoping that his occupation might convince slaveholders there to cast their lot with the government in Richmond. So cast their lot means to join. The government in Richmond is the Confederacy. On September 8th, he issued a proclamation to the citizens of the Old Line State. That's the nickname for Maryland, the Old Line State, telling them his army was, quote, prepared to assist you with the power of its arms and promised Marylanders that the Confederate states would, quote, welcome you to your natural position, unquote, among fellow slave owners. Lee, however, had overestimated Southern sympathies. The mountainous region his army occupied contained far fewer slave owners compared to large coastal plantations to the east. Few new recruits flocked to the rebel flag. Somehow that makes me think of a question that I had to ask. Let's go back and look at questions. How did the geography, the terrain, the soil of the region that Lee occupied affect the fact that few new recruits flocked to the rebels? Few new recruits flocked to the rebels. Okay. The mountainous region his army occupied contained far fewer slave owners compared to large coastal plantations to the east. Oh, yeah, because you can't grow, you can't have a big plantation of tobacco or cotton in the mountains. So those people are going to be small farmers. They're not going to have slaves, so they don't really care about slavery because it doesn't help them at all. Oh, okay. So, hmm, maybe that would be a question and an answer. While his proclamation fell on deaf ears, back to reading, Lee was forced to address the threat to his communication and supply lines back to Virginia. He devised a bold plan to divide his army to capture the Union troops in his rear while still maintaining presence in Maryland. On September 9th, he issued Special Order 191. The order sent Lieutenant General James Longstreet's wing. Now, you know from when you did Army Corps, which is why I had you do that, when you did Army units and organization, you know that a lieutenant general is over a corps. And a corps is one of the big pieces of, or the wing of, an army. So Lee is taking one of the big parts of his army and cutting it off from the rest of his army, followed by Major General Daniel H. Hill's division. You know that a division is smaller than a wing or a corps, westward toward Hagerstown. Hill would defend the passes of South Mountain while Longstreet pushed further west. Lieutenant General Stonewall Jackson's wing, so that tells you that there are two wings, because a bird has two wings. We have two sides. So Lee had divided his army into two parts, two wings. So he was taking his 70,000 men and cutting them in half. So instead of having 
his army, 70,000 versus 80,000, he was going to cut them in half so that he would have far fewer, only half of his army, against McClellan's 80,000. With Major General Lafayette McClaws and John G. Walker would capture Martinsburg and Harper's Ferry by the 13th. If all went as planned, all four groups, now he's divided his army into four separate groups that are apart from each other, would then reunite west of South Mountain. What's my next question here? I want to remind myself. What bad luck for the Confederates gave Union Commander McClellan a huge advantage and the reason to brag to President Lincoln that he had the rebels? Okay, so I should be looking for that. Okay. Lee's plans soon unraveled. On September 13th, McClellan received a gift when a lost copy of Special Order 191 was brought to his headquarters. Are you kidding me? So McClellan has Lee's playbook and his plans. Although the intelligence was four days old, McClellan knew immediately that one, Jackson was behind schedule as Harper's Ferry was surrounded, while surrounded, had not yet been taken, and two, that Lee's army was divided and separated over miles of Maryland countryside. Seeing an opportunity, seeking an opportunity to beat Lee piecemeal, meaning one at a time, taking out instead of one big army, four separate little pieces, McClellan ordered his cavalry to verify the positions of Lee's forces. That evening, McClellan bragged to Lincoln about having all the plans of the rebels and ordered his men to prepare to move up South Mountain where Hill's unsuspecting Confederates guarded the mountain gaps. Look at my next question here. Who won the battle? Explain. McClellan engaged Hill's division early on September 14th. After an all-day fight, Hill's men were withdrawn from the mountain gaps. That evening, defeated and with his army still scattered, Lee sought to return to Virginia, ending his bold gamble north of the Potomac. As he contemplated a return home via Sharpsburg and Shepherdstown, Lee received word from Jackson that the surrender of the federal force at Harper's Ferry was imminent, about to happen, imminent. Changing his mind, Lee drew up plans to halt his retreat, bring most of Jackson's men to join Longstreet, bring his wings back together, and to make a stand against McClellan's army. To hold against McClellan, Lee chose a four-mile-long position on the west bank of Antietam Creek. The deep, swift-moving waterway could only be crossed at three bridges, and rolling farm fields connected with roads provided artillery platforms and room to maneuver his infantry. Three miles in his rear was Lee's escape route home the Potomac River crossing at Butler's Ford near Shepherdstown. On the morning of September 15th, McClellan's army arrived at Keatysville, four miles east of Sharpsburg, and discovered Longstreet's wing drawn up behind Antietam Creek. Jackson had not yet joined Longstreet, so an opportunity to defeat half of Lee's men slipped from McClellan's grasp. Early on the morning of September 16th, a heavy fog enveloped the area. As McClellan waited for the fog to burn off, Jackson's men began crossing the Potomac on their way to Sharpsburg. McClellan decided to attack Lee's left across the upper northernmost bridge. Around 4 p.m., Major General Joseph Hooker's 1st Corps crossed Antietam Creek and skirmish, that means light fighting, with the Confederates, setting the stage for the next day's fight, the bloodiest in American history. Intense fighting raged for 12 hours on September 17th. That evening and the next day, both armies remained in their lines. Both sides cared for their wounded and counted their losses. About 23,000 men from both sides. On the night of September 18th, 
Lee began to withdraw across the Potomac River back into Virginia using Bottler's Ford near Shepherdstown. For the next two days, small groups of Union infantry pushed across the river and attacked the Confederate rear guard. The action discouraged McClellan's pursuit of the Confederates further into Virginia and marked the end of Lee's Maryland campaign. So, who won the battle, Lee or McClellan? Why would you say that? And then when we say a battle is bloody, when we think about lots of losses, we may like to think about World War II. D-Day was a terribly, terribly bloody day. The Battle of the Audrang Valley, if you watch that movie, it's very realistic. It's stunning. We lost many good men and women in Fallujah. But remember what we just read about Antietam, and never forget that name. I guarantee it will be on our test that's coming up. I hope this helped. God bless you all, and have a great, great day.